Hello, yes. Again, welcome everybody to the Center for Subsurface Energy and Environment uh, webinar se series here. This is a series where we, we, we present um, some of the interesting research being done at the center and um, <clears throat> that is relevant throughout the rest of the industry. So who are we? Here's a picture of all of us. Today's speaker is Dr. McCool Sharma down here in the bottom left, handsome young man there. Um, just what types of research do we do in, in, in the center here? Uh, we have mainly basically three different things. We look at subsurface applications, technical disciplines, and engineering tools. You can see the whole breakdown in our pie charts above. Um, the main uh, funding source for a lot of our research is our industrial affiliates programs. And these are targeted on specific problems uh, in the industry or in subsurface problems. Um, uh, you can see the list of them all above here. If you're interested in any of them, please let us know. Okay, so let's just talk about our monthly webinars. This is what we're doing today. Um, see, these are some of the ones we've had in the past, nano, nano bubble dispersions, water production, the Permian, machine learning, and also uh, chemical methods for improving oil recovery. These are always informative industry dri industry driven webinars by researchers and collaborators of CSEE. Um, do it every second Tuesday of the month at noon. I think this is the third Tuesday, maybe this one. Maybe got moved back a, a week because um, uh, for this month, but we're glad you're here today. All webinars are going to be on YouTube, and we are next one coming up at November 12th is Professor Zoya Hadari in our department here, and we will not be having one in December for the holidays. Okay, so we also have sponsorship opportunities if you want to be a sponsor of the webinar. You can see the details here on the screen. Um, we get quite a few viewers and you get a benefit. You get to reach a global audience. If you're interested in being a sponsor, please contact Hugh Daigle. His info is also on the screen. And you can also pause these webinars at any time when they're on the YouTubes. Okay, today's webinar is what we're getting to today. It's the main thing. First order of business. There's going to be interesting things that Dr. McCool Sharma is talking about today. If you have any questions, don't wait till the end to post them. You can just put them in um, the Q&A section of your browser, of the um, of the client or whatever you call these things, how it's all run. Um, they will all be listed up and then we, uh, Dr. Sharma will get to the questions at the end. So you don't have to remember to write it down and enter at the end, you can enter at any time, okay? And you will also see this on the YouTube channel, but you can't put questions there because it'll be over with by that, okay? Today's speaker, we're very glad to have Dr. McCool Sharma. Uh, talk about design of water injection programs, lessons learned over the past 40 years. You can see his bio right here. Uh, he's been with us um, at UT ever since longer than here. He's been here for 39 years. Since he's a younger man here, he's still a pretty young man. Um, um, he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering. He's co-founded companies. He's done a lot of work um, in this field. And in particular, I learned from him a lot about water injection. I'm interested to learn what he's got new in the last 40 years here. So with that, I'm going to throw it over to Makul. I will talk today about uh, some work we've been doing for many years on looking at uh, water injection programs. Uh, as you all know, uh, water is injected in the ground um, for various reasons, whether it's water flooding or pressure maintenance or waste disposal and so forth. And there's a large body of, of knowledge and literature that's been available um, uh, over the past decades. Uh, what I want to show you is that there's actually um, a tremendous amount that we don't know as well. And uh, there's also some very interesting questions that have that we've resolved over the past uh, two or three decades. Um, it, really, what we're doing today is is very different than what we were doing 20 or 30 years ago uh, in terms of uh, water injection programs. Now, the issues that we deal with in water injection programs are typically issues related to water treatment facilities, uh, injector performance. So looking at water quality specifications, injection rates, produced water treatment requirements, and uh, that determines our injection water uh, facilities. Uh, where is the water growing? Uh, going? Uh, whether it's uh, distributed into different layers, what's the sweep, what's the recovery factors, and so on. And uh, quite often, you, 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 we can be surprised as to where the water is going, um, uh, primarily because of some of the geomechanical things that we've learned over the last two or three decades. Uh, 
And then finally, uh, issues related to completions. Uh, what type of completions should you have? Open hole, cased hole, track packs, and so on. I may not have time to go into this today in, in any detail, but I'll certainly address the first two uh, issues. So um, I'll, I'll start off with giving you a, 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 a Gulf of Mexico uh, case study uh, and then talk about uh, role of induced fractures, injection induced fractures on injectivity, uh, looking at Prudhoe Bay as a case study and then looking at uh, factors that, in, that influence injectivity and fracture containment and, and so forth. So I'll talk about many of these different things. Uh, maybe the bottom two I may not have time to because I have uh, probably too many slides. Um, so let's start with uh, uh, Bullwinkle, which was one of the early platforms in the Gulf of Mexico. This was a shell platform that was drilled and completed uh, with five injection wells uh, below the oil water contact in 91, 92. We got involved with them uh, at that time. And uh, this was a very high permeability sand, about a, you know, a, a Darcy sand uh, with gravel pack screen completions. Uh, large volumes of polymer were used for fluid loss control, high initial skins, and uh, most of these wells were acidized with 10% HCL before they were injection was started. There were five injectors uh, for seawater injection. Uh, uh, and this, this is a typical program for uh, uh, seawater injection even today. Uh, seawater taken from 150 foot subsea, deoxygenated with countercurrent gas stripping, with chemical scavengers, bacteria control, calcium carbonate scale inhibitor, and in this particular case, they actually went through a lot of care to ensure that the water quality was very good. So we had primary multimedia filters, secondary cartridge filters, uh, so very good water quality, one to seven ppm of, of solids in the injection water with about average particle size of two to three microns. All of this was measured multiple times during the injection program. And so you, we had the particle size distribution uh, the abundance of different uh, uh, minerals or, or metals in the in the in, in the uh, solids that were retained in on a filter paper, um, but what the what the results showed is shown here, and it was kind of uh, disappointing uh, for all five injectors. This is just one particular injector, A10. On um, uh, on the on the left hand side is the injection rate, which is in, shown in blue here. The red line is the is the pump pressure. So the pump pressure was held relatively constant um, and it was held below the fracture gradient of the sand, uh, deliberately so, so that you don't fracture the injector. And what you see here is that the injectivity declined or the injection rate declined at constant injection pressure. Their target injection rate, by the way, was 10,000 battles a day. So this is 10,000 battles a day was the target. And then they found the injectivity declined. They did a hydrochloric acid treatment on the injector injectivity went way up from about 2,000 to 8,000 battles a day, declined again very quickly. And this period of time between these, these uh, stimulation treatments is only of the order of a few months. So you're talking about, let's say, 80 days to 220 days. So, so relatively short period of time, let's say six months or something. Uh, and so the decline in injectivity was so severe, 8,000 to 1,000, that it surprised everybody because a great deal of care had been taken to, to treat the water extremely well. Um, when they did a mud acid treatment here, they got a huge improvement in the injectivity and the injection rate, and then the decline started again. Um, so the question really boiled down to, well, why is this happening? You know, what is causing this sort of decline? And uh, this is another well, the same kind of thing with well A09, which is also an injector. Injection rates drop off fairly quickly. Um, the half-life of these ejectors is three to four months. Um, and so really what, what turned out to be uh, the explanation was, was something that um, uh, we should have probably foreseen, but, but did, nobody knew at the time because this is the conventional wisdom back in the 90s was uh, what uh, the injectors would do over time. So all of this, by the way, is published in this paper in the SPE Production and Facilities in 2000. Uh, this is the offshore Gulf of Mexico case study that we published with uh, uh, with with Shell. Um, so, no matter how clean you get your water, you get a significant amount of particles that are injected uh, over the life of the well. So, I'll give you one example. Let's say at 10,000 battles a day, with 10 ppm, which is 10 milligrams per liter of solids, you convert this to uh, liters and so on. 
and you calculate how many solids you're injecting. So you're actually injecting about 16 kilograms of solids a day, even with relatively clean water. So 10 milligrams a liter or 10 ppm is relatively clean water, and you're injecting about 16 kilograms a day. Uh, that is about 5.8 tons per year. Um, the, 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 the problem here is that all of these solids that you're injecting with the injection water are not traveling very far into the formation, even though the particles are quite small relative to the pore size. So in this one Darcy sand, the average pore size was of the order of you know, 15 to 20 microns, you know, uh, whereas the average particle size was about uh, you know, one to five microns. So very small particle size, but they all got trapped within a very shallow distance uh, from the well bore. How do we know that they're trapped very close to the well bore? Well, because if they were not, then these mud acid treatments wouldn't be quite as successful. These mud acid treatments were entirely a result of the cleaning up of siliceous fines or any other fines within about four to six inches from the well bore. And so all these particles that are collecting four to six inches, six inches around the well bore are cleaned up by this mud acid. And you see this very significant improvement in injectivity. So we know from this data that you get particles that are being trapped fairly close to the well bore itself. Whereas the models that had been used earlier predicted that these particles would travel much further. And so you have a much larger area or volume to trap these particles. Once you know this, then you can begin to say, OK, so if the particles are being trapped fairly close to the well bore, you can see why the injectivity would decline uh, fairly quickly. Um, if you look at the injectivity index, which is the flow rate divided by the bottom hole pressure minus the reservoir pressure, these, this injectivity in index um, normalized with the initial injectivity, which is the injectivity ratio, uh, will show something like that, right? And so this big giant increase in the uh, injectivity is entirely a result of dissolving or removing those particles that are plugging the neo well bore region, right? Now, the reason that this, this sort of uh, had escaped a lot of people's uh, in, uh, intuition was that at the Right through uh, the last 100 years where water has been injected into the ground, we have seen relatively constant injection uh, rates and injection pressures for long periods of time. A great example of that is uh, Prudhoe Bay. We were involved in Prudhoe Bay at about the same time as this Gulf of Mexico study. Um, at that time, there, were at one point, there was 1.4 million barrels a day of produced water and 0.9 million barrels of seawater being injected via 197 injectors. This injection program is still continuing, and in fact, uh, uh, they have, I think, a few more injectors, but roughly uh, similar volumes of water being injected uh, in Prudhoe Bay. Uh, and in this particular case, the exact opposite was happening. There was no decline in injectivity when injecting up to 2,000 ppm of solids in oil. In fact, uh, ARCO and BP at the time had built uh, very extensive water treatment facilities for Prudhoe Bay, uh, for treating the water down to 10 ppm or, or less of solids and oil. And there was a large amount of uh, studies done on looking at injectivity decline using cores and things like that. Uh, what they found indeed was that uh, if they bypassed the facility completely, bypassed the water treatment facility completely, uh, the injectivity remained essentially the same. And of course, the reason for that is that you get uh, hydraulic fractures or injection induced fractures being uh, created in these wells. Um, and those fractures show some very characteristic trends. For example, when you inject produced water at 150 degrees Fahrenheit, with the fracture gradient is about 0.57 to 0.6, with seawater injection at 80 degrees Fahrenheit, which is colder, the fracture gradient is about 0.53 to 0.54 PSI per foot. Uh, and well orientation also affects injectivity. So this is data taken from uh, a paper by BP uh, in which they plotted the injection rate versus the wellhead injection pressure. And you can see that for seawater injection, which are the open uh, dots, triangles and circles, and the blue trend line, uh, this the red line is the trend line for produced water uh, reinjection. And let's say at 10,000 barrels a day of injection, the pressure required, the wellhead pressure required to inject seawater 
is let's say 1200 PSI, whereas for produced water injection, it's about 1700 PSI. So higher pressures required for produced water injection compared to seawater under the same conditions. What's the difference between these two? Well, this water is colder and this water is warmer. And so injecting cold water results in hydraulic fractures being initiated and propagating at lower pressures than uh, produced water. So you get a big difference in the injection pressures needed of several hundred PSI difference in injection pressures needed as you um, uh, cool the water down and, 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 and re reverse. If you have warmer water, you require higher pressures. And these are all related to thermal fracturing, which is occurring in Prudhoe Bay even today. Um, the azimuth of the well and the deviation of the well also increased, uh, also changed the injection pressures. And I'm not going to go into this in any detail because it's a long explanation, but but uh, certainly the propagation of these fractures is, is influenced by the, um, the, um, uh, the orientation uh, of the fractures is, uh, controls the, the pressures required to propagate these fractures. <clears throat> Back then in the 90s, um, everybody would thump the table and say very, very uh, uh, vehemently that we never fracture our injection wells. And In fracturing injection wells is never done and it should never be done. Um, I think that experience in the, in the 90s basically completely flipped that argument on its head. Because today, uh, I would say a vast majority, and I'm talking about 95% of injectors, are fractured either deliberately or without even knowing it, right? So without, without fracturing these injectors, you really cannot get um, the kind of long-term injectivity that's essential to maintain uh, water injection in these injectors. So uh, this is the 40s experience from 75 to 96. Uh, again, core flow experiments indicated 90% reduction in injectivity over six months. In the field, when they removed the fine filters, it had no adverse effect on the injectivity of seawater. And so you could inject 50 to 1200 ppm of oil and 5 to 50 ppm of solids, and your injectivity, the long term injectivity, remains constant. Um, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't really change very much at all with the water quality. So, same thing with the Norwegian sector, um, uh, the Ula, Magnus, and Gaida fields, removal of fine filters has no impact on injectivity. And uh, when you do hydraulic impedance testing, which was done, by the way, after all this work was published, a lot of people began to look at their injectors again and started doing impedance testing. And they showed that all the fractures, all, all the injectors were indeed fractured. So uh, all 50 of them. This is an example, a, a case study we did in, in Brazil. Um, uh, in which, uh, actually in, in, in Colombia, I'm sorry, uh, this is many about 20, 25 years ago, where the injection rates were dropping off in one case. With a fixed bottom hole pressure, the injectivity was falling off very quickly in this particular case. That was because the injection pressures were below the frac gradient in a high stress environment. In other words, it's more difficult to propagate fractures. In a lower stress environment in the same field. You found that the injectivity was basically constant, and this was entirely related to the propagation of fractures in this low stress environment versus no fracture propagation in the high stress environment. So the bottom hole pressure goes up. Fractures are initiated. And then the bottom hole pressure remains relatively constant. The fracture lengths then grow not very much, um, but they grow out to about 80 feet uh, in a matter of three years or so. We've done uh, similar studies uh, for uh, around about 40 fields around the world. Uh, many of these are um, in, the, in the deep water Gulf of Mexico, Tahiti, Bigfoot, Ketu, Lucius, Thunder Horse, Shenzi, Heidelberg. These are all Gulf of Mexico fields. And we've done studies that are not published, but there we've done studies on, on all of these different fields uh, over the last uh, two, three decades. <coughs> If you want to understand this uh, fracturing process better and with water injection, we did these very large block tests at the facility uh, with, which Teratech uh, had. This is about one cubic meter, so one, one meter by one meter by one meter in size. 
and you have an injection well uh, in, in the middle in which water is injected. And these red dots indicate places where we had drilled pressure taps so we could monitor the pressure at these locations in, in, in this block. And then there was stresses applied, 2100 PSI with flat jacks and 1400 PSI here. So we knew which direction the fracture was going to go in. So the idea was you inject water and you monitor how fast the fracture is propagating in this in this block to understand how these fractures grow. Um, here's a, one of the results of uh, uh, the test that we ran. This is the injectivity versus time in the blue line. And what you find is that the injectivity remains constant despite the fact that you're injecting dirty water. The colors in the background indicate the particles that were being injected. So here's an emulsion of oil and, and water. Uh, then the, the white bars here indicate clear water or clean water being injected. This is a concentrated emulsion of oil and water. And these are different polymer particles with different colors that we wanted to identify uh, being injected. So different concentrations of particles, different types of particles, solid particles versus emulsions, doesn't matter. The injectivity remained essentially constant. And what you find is that every time you inject clean water, the injectivity goes up. So in this white region, the injectivity goes up. Here you see the injectivity going up. Here you see the injectivity going up, OK? So what is happening here is that there's a fracture propagating. And as the fracture propagates, if you inject clean water, the clean water doesn't have any particles to plug the fracture. So the fracture continues to propagate, which is what gives you this increase in injectivity and a decrease in the bottom mole pressure because there's a clean fracture that is not being plugged by particles when you inject clean water. Okay. This is the fracture length. There's two, half, there's two uh, wings to the fracture. So this is one wing of the fracture and that's the other wing of the fracture. And what is interesting here is that when you're injecting these emulsions, both wings of the fracture grow at a certain rate. So this is the fracture length in inches over a 24 hour period. And you can see the fractures grow at a certain at a certain rate when you're injecting this, this these emulsions. When you inject these kind of polymer particles, the fracture doesn't grow hardly at all. But when you inject this kind of particle, the fracture grows very, very fast. So the rate at which the fracture grows depends on what kind of particles are being injected. If the particles form a filter cake or plug the rock, and that filter cake is impermeable, so you have very little leak off, then the fractures will grow very quickly because the injection fluid has to be accommodated into the matrix. And to do that, it has to go through this filter cake. In this particular case, the filter cake had a pretty high permeability, so the fractures don't need to grow. You can have leak off occurring from the fractures, from the fracture faces without growing the fracture at all. At the end of the experiment, we actually took thin sections. We took cores and we took thin sections uh, in, in and around the fracture. So this is the actual fracture. These orange dots that you see are particles that we had injected. And you can see they travel just about a few millimeters away from the fracture face. And then they plug the face of the fracture uh, around the, the very close to the face of the fracture. Um, this is the tip of the fracture. And the tip of the fracture doesn't have any particles because the, the, it's too, too narrow and those it, particles have a hard time getting there. But you can see particles all around the fracture plugging um, the, the, the matrix around the fracture um, at some distance away from the tip. This is the, uh, 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 the block itself when we took it apart at the end of the experiment. These are the cores taken. And you can see that the particles that we injected, so we had injected black particles at the end of the experiment. And you can see those end up near the tip of the fracture. So whatever particles you inject are not able to leak off from the face of the fracture, but they end up near the tip of the, of the, of the fracture and they plug off this tip of the fracture. So these are different bands corresponding to different dyes and different particles that we were injecting. And this is really how uh, uh, these particles plug the fracture and propagate the fracture. So the lessons learned from these experiments and all of this field work that we were doing uh, 
was that injectivity remains essentially constant despite plugging by particles. Um, what is happening in, instead is when you plug the, the, the fracture, the bottom hole pressure tries to increase, but it cannot increase beyond. Uh, when it tries to increase, the fracture grows some more to accommodate this increase. So the mechanical constraints put on the system are that the fracture will grow when the bottom hole pressure goes up. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the pressure drops abruptly when brine is injected. And the rate of fracture growth is closely related to uh, the trapping of these particles. Uh, the injected particles do not travel very deep into the formation. The invasion depth is, is actually quite shallow. In some cases, if you inject very dirty water, there was some evidence of filling up the fracture with solids and oil. And the injected particles appear to end up mostly at the fracture tip, except when fracture filling occurs. <clears throat> so, when you imagine what's happening in long term water injection, what you should imagine is um, plugging happening close to the well bore. As the bottom hole pressure rises, you reach the fracture uh, propagation pressure. Fractures are initiated in these in these layers, and the fracture face gets plugged. And the bottom hole pressure remains uh, relatively constant. <coughs> Excuse me. Which means the injectivity remains relatively constant. Now, initially, the flow divides into each layer based on um, the KH of each layer. But once fractures are initiated, um, it is controlled by uh, which layers have fractures in them and which ones don't. So this process of particle plugging becomes critical in determining the fluid leak off and the fracture growth rate in all these injectors. So we model this in some detail. So we have several papers on looking at how this internal filtration occurs, how the external filtration occurs, and what is the pressure drop uh, induced by, by, these, by these particle plugging effects. Now superimposed on top of these, these plugging effects are thermal effects and pore pressure effects. So the injection of cold water reduces the fracture gradient because uh, the stress gradient required to propagate the fracture decreases as the um, the res as the rock is cooled, and the magnitude of this reduction depends on the rock properties. So it's more significant for hard rocks. High Young's modulus is less significant for soft rocks, and this effect can be hundreds of psi. So this has been we've seen this in many many fields. Uh, smaller injection pressures being needed for injecting cooler water, and of course we model this. Uh, uh, by through geomechanical and thermal models that we have. Uh, an increase in reservoir pore pressure will result in larger injection pressures being needed to inject water. So the poroelastic effects will counterbalance the thermal effects. And so increase in reservoir pore pressure results in uh, an increase in the fracture propagation pressure. Now, keep in mind that the pore pressure increase has to occur near the fracture tip because that's where the fracture is propagating. The increases in bottom hole pressure or increases in pore pressure near the well bore have less of an effect because uh, that's not where the fracture is propagating. So just very quickly to show you, you can actually model the change in the, the fracture propagation pressure when the fracture tip pressure exceeds sigma one. Sigma one is the sigma H min plus the change due to thermal stresses plus the change due to poroelastic stresses. And so that's why geomechanics becomes so important in modeling um, these injection wells. Uh, 20 years ago, or maybe 25 years ago, um, people wouldn't worry about injection well fractures. In fact, I remember going into several company offices and saying, uh, have you modeled this, this very large field? And they would say, yes, we've done all this reservoir modeling. Do you have any fractures in your injection wells? And they said, well, we don't have any fractures in our injection wells. And I would say, you know, I think you do. I think you should look for them by testing these wells. And sure enough, in almost every case, those injection wells were fractured without the company knowing that they had fractured these injection wells. And it was having a profound effect on where the water was going. So this is the growth of an injection well fracture. Initial bottom hole pressure, it goes up, exceeds sigma H min, and then the fractures propagate, and the bottom hole pressure remains virtually constant. Okay. So 
this is the sort of thing. This is I'll show you a list of references in the end, so you can you can pick out some of these things from there. So if you look at the injectivity, it declines and then becomes relatively constant. This, the quality of the water, 3 ppm versus 30 ppm, controls how quickly this happens. For dirty water, this happens very quickly. For clean water, it, happen, it, it may take several months. This is an example with no thermal stresses. If you include thermal stresses, then you can get things that are more complicated. Um, the fracture lengths will tend to grow faster with dirtier water, and that's what you expect. So <laughs> what we what we learned so far is that water quality or number of ppm of solids in the injection water uh, does not control injectivity in a fractured injector. Instead, it controls fracture growth and fracture length. So because of that, fracture containment becomes a critical issue. Um, and so we have to understand how the stress contrast between the sand that you're injecting into and the shale above is going to impact fracture containment and do this while you're doing um, thermal stresses and photoelastic stresses and the rest of it right so all of this all of these uh, results are uh, looking at the ability of the fracture to stay within zone um, usually when you permit these injection wells your your permitted injection pressures are below the fracture gradient for the shale above uh, the sand that you're injecting into, right? So injecting into the sand at a high enough pressure to fracture it is perfectly okay as long as you don't exceed the pressure, the the fracturing pressure in the in in the shale. So here is um, some examples of how this can be done with a, a model that we had built many years ago, um, uh, and in fact uh, have used very extensively looking at comparing field data, the dots with actual uh, uh, simulation results and so forth. So we've actually done that. And so one of the concerns that we have, and I'll show you some other interesting results on containment in a minute, but I want to show you first what the consequences are for fractures growing in these injection wells. <clears throat> so let's assume that we have a five spot and you have, you're injecting water into these layers. You have a fracture that grows, and then you have a water flood front that propagates. Um, and the question is, well, why should we even treat our water if it's having no impact, effect on the injectivity? Well, the answer is you treat your water because you want the fractures to be reasonable in length, right? So if you have very long fractures, like so, and the fractures happen to be going towards your producers, then you run into this question of, well, am I bypassing reserves? And of course you are. Uh, so you can change your oil recovery by several percent, several tens of percent, depending on what the orientation of the fractures is relative to the injectors and producers. So, so you can actually get uh, significant effects on oil recovery as a consequence of these growing fractures. Now, this effect becomes magnified tremendously if you have multiple layers, and if you have uh, high permeability, low permeability layers, uh, then you can have just tremendous effects associated with with this uh, with this fracture growth. Here's a very simple example. In this particular case, the fracture is growing away from the producers, so this is a very ideal situation. You would think where the fracture is not going towards the producers at all, but we have two layers, and one layer has a lower stress. And so the fracture begins to grow in that layer before it starts to grow here. Look at the uh, oil recovery that you get in the unfractured case, ideal performance. In the fractured case, half the oil recovery. So you've cut your oil recovery in half because the fracture is growing in that layer. Why? Because look at the flow allocation. The flow allocation, almost all the fluid is going into this layer. Hardly any fluid is going into this layer. So it has a dramatic effect on the oil recovery that you achieve in these layered formations. And we've seen this in, in by doing PLTs or, or uh, uh, basically running injection logs to see how much water is going into each sand. And this is very real. This actually does happen. And by the way, this happens without people realizing that it's happening. 
uh, because there is no flag or indicator on the surface that tells you that your injector is fractured. This happens without anybody even realizing it on the surface unless you look for it. And of course, the water cut goes up quickly because this breaks through much faster. Uh, when you have fractured case, the water cut goes up very quickly and uh, you, you water out your reservoirs very quickly without even flooding the bottom sand at all. So this uh, fracturing in multi-layered sands can have a dramatic effect on oil recovery. This is an actual case study we did uh, in uh, offshore Canada where you have an oil water contact and you have a producer and you have an injector. And uh, the operator was interested in finding out what was, uh, what are the water quality specifications that they should use for uh, this injector? Should they put in a lot of facilities on the platform to clean the water and so on? Or, or what was the uh, recommendations? And so I, I we, when we did the modeling and did all the, the, the design work for them, we basically said, okay, which or, what's the orientation of the stresses here? And the initial response I got back was, well, we don't really know very well, but we can ask the drilling people. And so they did. Um, and so the drilling people said, oh yeah, the, here's the orientation. And it turns out that the orientation was such that the fractures would propagate orthogonally to the wellbore and would actually intersect this producer um, uh, if, if they didn't change the orientation of the wells. So uh, the consequence of this is, is, is that you get water flood fronts that, that break through very early and you have bypass regions of the reservoir, right? Um, in fact, if you were to reorient these wells at 90 degrees, you would get a much better performance because the fractures would actually go longitudinal and that would give you a nice, very nice uh, uh, drive uh, towards the producer essentially a line drive towards the producer so that you could get much better recovery in these situations. And in fact, that's what they ended up doing. So a question that started off with water quality specifications for the injector essentially altered the reservoir engineering and the drilling plan for the reservoir. So now we have spent the last uh, 10, 15 years working on um, modeling these different things, primarily because they weren't very good models available for uh, looking at coupled geomechanics and compositional reservoir simulation and fracture propagation, and we're still actively working on this. Um, and I'll show you some case studies that we've done with this simulator. Uh, the reservoir domain, for example, is a fully compositional reservoir simulator, which has uh, all the component balances, equation of state, you know, flash calculations, etc. It's coupled with the solid deformation of the rock, so it calculates the stresses and the strains and so forth and the reservoir temperature. Uh, we've recently added a geochemical model, so we can do CO2 injection, et cetera, with this geochemical model. Um, uh, now, this is coupled to the fracture domain because we always have fractures in these, in these wells. Um, I, can, I can tell you with, with honesty that I've hardly ever done a case study in the last 20 years which didn't have fractures in it. Um, so in the fracture domain, we solved exactly the same sorts of equations. Uh, component balances, um, et cetera. In the case of hydraulic fracturing, we actually have propane transport as well, uh, temperature, and then we also have natural fractures that we've recently in the last five years included in this in these in these models. So the hydraulic fractures interact with the natural fracture network. And this is something we've done for geothermal uh, in the forge site, for example. We've done a lot of work on modeling of that for geothermal applications. And then we have the wellbore domain which when we started we thought was the least important but it turns out to be one of the most important uh, with regard to uh, uh, the placement of hydraulic fractures and propent during hydraulic fracturing now for water injection it's less important but it certainly plays a very big role and in fact uh, we have recently added inflow control devices in the well bore and modeling these inflow control devices and i'll show you an example of that I'm not going to go through the equations, but I just wanted to, those of you that are uh, uh, are interested in the equations, the papers have all these equations, which essentially uh, for black oil, it has the black oil, regular, standard black oil equations. The the, uh, the the displacement, U is the displacement, and, it, and from this you calculate the stresses and strains, um, and then the energy balance for the temperature. Um, so this basically solves uh, uh, the, the reservoir simulation problem with geomechanics, 
uh, and of course you can do it in 3D or 2D. Um, uh, it has thermoelastoplastic models, uh, linear elastic fracture mechanics, as well as displacement discontinuity models for natural fractures, thermal options, uh, fracture options, reservoir options of um, multiple fractures propagating so they can have stress shadow effects, etc. Um, you can have natural fractures and, of course, any heterogeneity in the reservoir. Uh, different types of rheologies of fluids, including energized fluids. Uh, uh, different types of propens with settling and retardation. And then it is parallelized. It is uh, uh, it is uh, uh, it has dynamic mesh refinement and unrefinement, and it can be run on multiple cores. Some of the problems that we have solved and worked on uh, using this model uh, are uh, hydraulic fracture design, slick water fracks, energized fracks, perforation cluster design. So the so the forge side we helped in designing the uh, the uh, hydraulic fracture treatments for the geothermal applications, and in many other locations we've used this model for that. Uh, perforation cluster design: How do you actually design how many clusters, how many perforations per cluster, and so on. Uh, injector performance, long-term inj injection in conventional reservoirs, parent-child interference, gas injection, CO2 injection, flowback, etc., casing deformation, subsidence, and so on. Right, so many different problems. So for water injection processes, we've looked at photoelastic effects, thermoelastic effects, and injectivity decline. And um, I'll give you one example of uh, a fracture containment. Uh, this is a uh, 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 a reservoir uh, in uh, close to the Arctic. So there was uh, fracture containment was a big deal here. Injecting cold seawater. Uh, and when you inject cold seawater, you get, uh, of course, large uh, thermoelastic effects because of cold water injection. You also get photoelastic effects. So the fracture starts propagating in the sand. And uh, the question was, will this fracture remain contained? Uh, in the in, in the sand, or will it break through into the shale above? And if it did break through into the shale above, then there was the project was a no go because they didn't want to break through to the mud line in, the, in, in this offshore injector. So it turns out that the thermal effects uh, really play an important role here, and they reduce the stress due to thermal conduction. Now, thermal conduction is something that people hadn't considered before uh, some of this work was done. So it turns out thermal conduction for long-term injection of water can play an important role. So when you cool down the shale, it actually the stresses are reduced, and this cooling of the shale due to conduction results in uh, a breaching of the shale. And it turns out that the field was sold as a result of uh, this lack of containment of uh, water in this uh, in this uh, in the sand. You can also look at uh, how stresses change in the reservoir. Um, and um, let's see, I don't know if this thing is, th these are movies here, which apparently are uh, not playing for some reason, but okay, I have to click the button here. So, so this is the orientation of the uh, maximum principal stress. Um, and so this is polar elasticity only. Uh, this is thermoelasticity here. So you can see how the stresses are reorienting from an injector to a producer. So you can calculate the stresses everywhere and see how things change. Uh, this is particularly important if you have a whole bunch of wells in which you have injectors and producers. Over long-term injection, the stresses will change and the orientation of the stresses will also change. And this will give you different flooding patterns than you expect. So you can see these things flipping as a result of these reorientation of stresses. <laughs> And we've done uh, studies with nine spots and five spots and different patterns and so on to see how the water flood patterns change, how they how do they evolve, uh, how do the stresses affect this and, and so forth. So stress reorientation and fracture propagation with multiple wells is an interesting question uh, with both vertical wells and with inject with uh, horizontal wells. Um, I'm not going to have much time to uh, to talk about this, but there are papers that I'll I'll point you to where you can see. Uh, how this actually works with uh, uh, <clears throat> the other thing that I think becomes very important in water injection is this complicated geologic settings. You can actually have channel sands. This is an actual case study we did in which we looked at uh, fractures growing in, in these in these channels and exactly how these fractures would uh, would grow. Uh, I'm 
there should be a movie playing here, but be the history matching of the data. And then we actually have uh, water being injected into these into these into these uh, channels. Uh, <clears throat> this I, I won't be, have time to get into this in any detail because of time, but the, the completion design is also extremely um, sensitive to what happens to these injection wells. So, for example, if you have a sand in which into which you're injecting, and you are going to gravel pack the sand so that you're going to actually put gravel in here. Uh, uh, to 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 prevent sand production. If a fracture grows, then uh, it becomes difficult to actually maintain this uh, the quality of this uh, sand control. Uh, in fact, many of the gravel packs are lost to these fractures, so the sand actually disappears into the fracture. And as a result of that, you will tend to get a very different performance if you perforate down here in the sand, perforate up here in the sand, or perforate up here in the sand. Right, and so if you want to be careful about sand control, you have to uh, account for the fact that you're going to have injection-induced fractures, and the sand is going to be pushed out into these fractures, and you may lose sand control as a result of this displacement of the gravel into these into these fractures. Um, one more example of uh, these uh, sort of flow control devices um, that we've been modeling. This is a uh, this is a Middle Eastern uh, well and field in which you have very non-uniform distribution of fluid across this because of fractures growing. Uh, and the question that we asked was, well, if there's fractures growing in these deviated and, in, and horizontal wells, how should the ICDs or uh, inflow control devices be designed to actually do that? And there's a paper on this, which um, I won't have time to, to spend any time on, but you can definitely see that uh, you can actually control um, the flow into each one of these sections of the well bore by controlling the ICD designs in these injection wells to ensure that you have a uniform uh, you have a uniform uh, distribution of flow along this horizontal well. <coughs> so you can have multiple fractures propagating with ICDs being designed to account for that. Um, I think I'll I'll stop here without going through all of these things about drilling and so on. And I just want to summarize for you <coughs> a couple of important things. Uh, most sands will sustain injectivities for long periods of time if injection pressures are above the fracture gradient for the sand. And the injection pumps must be designed accordingly. If not, injectivities will decline quickly. A matrix injection leads to formation plugging, which injectivities will decline quickly, even if you treat the water uh, fairly extensively. A poor water quality does not affect long term injectivity, but creates long fractures, and this can have significant impact on reservoir development plans and oil recovery. So injectivity is not so affected, but reservoir development plans and oil recovery are because of the growing fractures. Uh, thermal stresses and photoelastic effects can both play an important role uh, in, in both for injectivity and for fracture containment and oil recovery. Um, and if you have completions issues, gravel pack completions, that sand control may be compromised if one operates above the frac gradient. Uh, in most cases, frac packs may be safer to use, and that's why people have gone to that in the Gulf of Mexico, for many of these studies uh, showed that. Uh, <clears throat> good vertical and aerial sweep must be maintained to monitor and, and monitored to, contr to control these injection-induced fractures. Otherwise, you'll get thief zones created by these fractures, which will bypass a lot of the oil behind. Um, Cross-flow between layers can be a major factor. Uh, water hammer effects, I didn't talk about this, but there's uh, some work we've done on that. Um, periodic monitoring of the, of the injection profile is good operating practice in many of, in many of these multi-layered reservoirs to see where the water is actually going. Uh, that It changes over time because of the growth of these, of these fractures. Uh, orientation of these horizontal injectors is, is quite important. Uh, and then fracture containment is often, is often critical. Uh, there's a bunch of papers. Uh, I'm just putting this up so that you can look at it later on um, in, uh, uh, in, the, in the recording uh, that, that summarize a lot of these, a lot of this work. Uh, it's, it spans uh, many years, so, so there's, there's quite a few papers, but, um, uh, but you can see that uh, uh, there's work that has been going on, going on for some time in, in, in this area. So, so thank you very much for your, for your attention, and um, I will take questions.
Do you have similar study for WAG, flood case study or design? Uh, we've done WAG studies as well. We've done some WAG studies in the, in, in fact, in the, in the Bakken, um, water alternating gas. And um, uh, you see, of course, it's more complicated, but you see similar kinds of effects there as well. Um, yes, can you talk about issues with water hammer, Byron? Um, yes, there's um, there's actually um, uh, many years ago, people used to think that water, uh, injection wells never really have any problems with sanding. But what we found is that uh, unscheduled um, uh, shutdowns, which means you know a sudden shutdown with the, uh, will result in a water hammer. And in many instances, uh, both in the North Sea and in the Gulf, we've seen those water hammer events causing a sanding up of injection wells. And we've modeled this process of water hammer effect causing pressure fluctuations in the well bore, causing the sand to come in. And it turns out that it can have a pretty significant effect. So, so people have really become very, very cautious in terms of unplanned shutdowns and how they manage these unplanned shutdowns so that you can have avoid these water hammer effects. But it, it can play a very important role. Uh, the water hammer effects are also very interesting because you can do diagnostics with them. And um, there's, uh, I guess, two or three papers that we have on looking at diagnostics that we have done with water hammer signatures. <clears throat> and those are all on the list of publications, I believe, that, that you have. So you can certainly go back to them. I haven't talked about it here, but it, it, there's quite a bit of uh, uh, literature on that. Uh, we, Like I said, we published three papers on that. Have you experienced a near well bore or reservoir water saturation level where the effect of injection, let's see more, uh, the effect of the injection decline is less dramatic. We see in Bohai that once we get about 70% water cut on the producers, that the loss in injectivity and productivity seems to stabilize and be less impactful. Now, um, I haven't talked about relative permeability effects here. Of course, we model all that, but um, generally on the, on the producer side, and I think you're talking about producers, um, Oh, the injection effect of inject, injection decline is less dramatic when the water saturation level changes. Um, the, the, the relative permeability effects depend entirely on the mobility of the two fluid phases, the oil mobility and the water mobility. Uh, sometimes when the water saturation is higher, the, the effects of plugging will be less pronounced. Um, also, if you have oil being injected, in other words, if you have droplets of oil, produced water being injected, then uh, higher uh, water cuts, uh, higher water saturations near the injector will play, uh, will, will uh, mitigate some of the effects of the oil droplets. So the oil droplets can play a much bigger role um, uh, early on in this, in, in the process. And then later on, it, it, it may be less and less of a role because it just adds to the residual oil saturation that's around the injector. But yeah, that's a that's a good point. And so you oil saturations and water saturations can 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 definitely play a role in the extent of injectivity decline. And on the production side, you will see a lot of issues with the producing wells typically when you have water breakthrough, uh, fines and so on, and productivity going down as a result of fines being mobilized as the water cut goes up. Reviewing the slide effect of well deviation, the GOMS water injectors are either drilled close to zero degrees vertical or horizontal to ensure optimum water injectivity. Uh, that's a question. Is zero to 20 degrees deviation a hard fast rule for GOM for vertical water injectors? Again, I think it depends on, on how, you, how much you're concerned about uh, sand production, what the thickness of the layers are, et cetera. So I would say that no, there's no hard and fast rule about uh, zero to 20 degrees as being the deviation for uh, GOM injectors. Uh, it really depends on, on um, you know, all of these different properties of the reservoir and so forth. So again, Tommy, we can talk later if you're interested in discussing that some more in detail, but that's a quick sort of uh, uh, answer to your question. <clears throat> 
Have you studied the effect of cold water injection into a very hot formation such as EGS? Yes, we've done that. Uh, we've looked at um, uh, the forge uh, geothermal um, uh, site and modeled the circulation of cold fluids into a very hot reservoir. The reservoir there is about 225C uh, and the water is being injected at uh, you know, surface temperature. So you can get some very significant thermal slugging and so forth, and of course, heating of the fluids I mean, as you circulate these fluids. There is a paper that's coming up next year on that, and we published one this year on, on the cold water injection into geothermal reservoirs. Um, so I, uh, it, it's it's uh, it's very interesting, and the reason we can we can uh, compare the simulations with with the with the field data is because we have a fiber optic cable in the producer, so we can actually see all the temperature effects, distributed temperature in the producing well, and see all these thermal slugs as we're injecting cold water, and um, so it's it was quite interesting how you, when you circulate fluids in the well itself, or when you circulate between wells, you can get some very interesting effects. Um, uh, so yes, we've done that. But yeah, so so since we've run out of time and it's one o'clock, uh, what I will say is um, this is a very interesting area of of of, of research, and and we're continuing to work on this. And of course, people want more and more complexity in these in these analyses and 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 in the in the hardware that we put in these wells, like all these inflow control devices and uh, very hot reservoirs, very you know deviated wells and all kinds of complicated geomechanics and so forth. So it's still a very active area and we're learning a lot as we combine the simulation work with the field data, combining those two, I think really leads to a tremendous amount of learning. So we really, I really appreciate everybody taking the time to attend this, uh, this talk. And uh, if I can help in any way, uh, be happy to talk to you. Thank you.